amidst one of the most severe freight recessions in recent memory, CargoJet represents a highly resilient freight leader with attractive upside. We would like to issue a buy recommendation based on a 12-month target price of $150, applying a 25% upside from last Friday's close. Our recommendation is predicated on our three thesis points. First, that CargoJet is exceptionally well-positioned, creating a strong margin of safety. Second, that through its high operating leverage and stronger-than-expected growth opportunities, the business will drive significant margin expansion. And third, that CargoJet is at a critical inflection point in its ability to generate returns. A framing CargoJet in the freight value chain, they carry goods from city A to city B on a plane, which is critical to upholding the value proposition of their customers given Canada's sparse geography. They're Canada's only scaled national dedicated air freight carrier and carry a variety of time-sensitive cargo, including e-commerce goods, food and beverages, and pharmaceuticals. The customers we interviewed echoed that they care most about three factors when it comes to moving time-sensitive cargo. And across factors, air freight is the only viable option for moving time-sensitive goods. And when looking at air freight options, you have passenger belly cargo and dedicated freighters. The dedicated freighters are unmatched in their ability to move time-sensitive cargo reliably, on time, and in large volumes. And CargoJet represents 90% of this market in Canada. CargoJet's revenue comes from four main sources, three of which are core segments to the business, and the fourth is a pass-through vehicle with no cash flow impact. Within the domestic overnight segment, CargoJet services over 90% of the dedicated market of the dedicated freight market for Canadians and for leading transportation and logistics customers like Amazon, FedEx, and UPS, all of whom reserve space on a cargo jet controlled flight to one of 16 hubs across Canada. This segment is characterized by extremely high quality revenue contracts with minimum volume and revenue guarantees, full fuel cost pass through, and annual price step ups. CargoJet also provides aircraft, crew, maintenance, and insurance in their ACMI segment to DHL, who makes up 95% of the segment, to service their European, Latin American, and Southeast Asian flights. DHL pays for all the costs to operate the flight and then pays CargoJet a rate on top of that. CargoJet also provides charters on an ad hoc basis, and this is on a cost plus spot rate basis. And although CargoJet was able to capitalize on growth exceptionally well throughout the pandemic, has recently been impacted by the ongoing freight recession. Diving deeper into the freight recession, supply declined dramatically during COVID due to a lack of passenger flights, driving air freight rates and yields both up, leading to significant industry-wide investment aiming to capture the strong demand in dedicated freighters. More recently, that demand has cooled off and the overinvestment has resulted in supply imbalances, driving rates down, all culminating into a very severe freight recession. Stepping back to see its impact on cargo jet, we know that COVID drove the share price up, and later the market began to punish the business due to fears over the freight recession and their ability to generate returns. However, management is now committed to strategy shift focused on returning capital to shareholders through share buybacks and dividend growth, which the market is rewarding. And re this reflects our own thesis that cargo jet is an exceptionally high quality business with strong margin expansion potential at a critical inflection point. Our first thesis is that CargoJet has very strong competitive positioning. To form a view on the business, our team interviewed 15 experts, including former executives, leaders, and advisors in competitors and customers. And what we found as a result of these interviews and our own analysis was that CargoJet is, at its core, an exceptionally well-positioned business. The three pillars of their defensiveness are the fact that first, the company has virtually no competitors domestically, and regulation blocks international players from flying point to point within Canada. Second, CargoJet has exceptional alignment with world-class customers internationally. And finally, the company represents a critical, but more importantly, very hard to replace portion of the Canadian supply chain. So first, CargoJet competes in a fundamentally different model than passenger airlines, competing for different types of freight. And though some passenger airlines have attempted to build up a dedicated freight capacity, experts we spoke to echoed our analysis that it is nearly impossible to do so without key anchor customers, all of whom CargoJet has locked down. This alignment with key customers is twofold. Firstly, through warrants, which CargoJet has issued to their major customers, Amazon and DHL, which provide high certainty revenue and lower their risk of replacement. And secondly, through material facility investments these players are making near some of CargoJet's biggest hubs, which further increase stickiness. And experts we spoke to don't believe there's any reason for these relationships to deteriorate. Finally, our team built a model to better understand the costs any individual player would have to incur in order to replace the services that CargoJet provides. And what we found was that unless an individual player can move upwards of 25% of the total national domestic volume in Canada each year, this doesn't make financial sense to do so. 
Building on from their competitive positioning, we believe that CargoJet has stronger than expected growth opportunities that should drive margin expansion given their high operating leverage. Starting off, we believe the market is underestimating CargoJet's growth potential, which comes from their two primary business segments. First, with a domestic overnight, Amazon believes Canada is one of its most important markets due to the low e-commerce penetration and strong population growth. They continue to invest heavily into Canada while cancelling and closing investments in other countries. Our team's primary research also shows that Canadian consumers value online shopping more now compared to pre-pandemic, indicating a secular shift in e-commerce behavior, driving the increasing penetration within the country. Additionally, through their ACMI agreement with DHL, CargoJet has access to Latin America and Southeast Asia, which as you can see on both charts are two emerging markets that are quickly fast growing and have demonstrated resiliency against the freight recession. After analyzing CargoJet's flight activity over the past three years, we know that they're a very important partner to DHL and have been helping them aggressively expand into these regions. In turn, DHL has also partnered with leading e-commerce marketplaces in both these areas and has made significant investments, driving the increasing volumes for the business. Keeping all of this in mind, 85% of CargoJet's direct costs are fixed, and these costs only increase when there are significant fleet expansions. Given management's current CapEx plan, we do not believe this is likely, and combining it with their high growth potential and operating leverage, we believe it provides a perfect runway for the business to see increased margins moving forward. CargoJet is now at a critical inflection point where margin expansion from increased volumes can be sustained without substantially growing their fleet. This will drive returns and management can return excess cash flows to shareholders. CargoJet has consistently outspent other dedicated freight peers in order to consolidate the Canadian market and to capitalize on growth in e-commerce. This has historically come at the cost of the heroic, leading to investor concerns in the past. However, they're now amidst a strategy shift that puts a pause on growth capex after 2025, which keeps their cost stable, and we have conviction that this plan can be successfully executed after analyzing their capacity and utilization on a go-forward basis, as they're currently at about 80%. And so this plan will overall drive about 9 points of heroic improvement, which can be equally attributable to both the completion of their capex plan and growth in NOPAT. In addition to this, their improving credit profile allows them to stay flexible in purchasing more aircraft if growth is stronger than expected. In addition to this, this strategy shift also generates significant free cash flows, which management has already begun to return to shareholders through a share buyback program and dividend growth of about 10%. And so overall, shareholder return is going to be a much more important part of CargoJet's capital allocation plan going forward. CargoJet's management strongly influences the realization of our theses. We have conviction in management as they have a strong track record of generating returns as well as beating and meeting targets in the past. These interests are strongly aligned with shareholders as the majority of management compensation is tied to EBITDA, ROIC, and total shareholder returns. And we believe that this will help CargoJet continue to drive growth. From an environmental perspective, CargoJet is in line with dedicated freighters and only lags integrators due to the more carbon-intensive nature of the dedicated freight model. We analyzed CargoJet's multi-pronged ESG approach and conducted our own proprietary ESG scorecard and determined that CargoJet does not materially lag behind their peers in any category, and this does not create a concern for the business. As there is no significant environmental concern, we've chosen not to place a discount based on ESG in our valuation and have valued the business using both relative and intrinsic methods. So on a relative basis, we've weighted comps at 20% to inform a market view on our valuation, but recognize that CargoJet has always traded at a strong premium to peers due to its unmatched competitive moat and unique operating model. And we believe it will trade closer to its long-term average of 11 times EBITDA in the future, creating a great opportunity to buy now. We've only valued on an EBITDA basis due to the high volatility and historical negative of earnings that they've demonstrated. Looking at an intrinsic basis, we've taken a constructive view on CargoJet with pricing growth around 2.5% and volume growth around 5%, which, given their high operating leverage, will drive a margin expansion of around 400 basis points. Now, across both the relative basis and terminal growth and exit multiple basis, using, uh, assuming all warrants are exercised in a fully diluted manner, we get a blended upside around 25% for the business, indicating a strong risk return profile. So despite our confidence in the recommendation, we've identified two risks that we believe are worth addressing. The first is high customer concentration as 80% of revenues come from top 10 customers. However, we believe this risk is mitigated by long-term revenue contracts, the high cost of insourcing, and the lack of alternatives. The second risk is concerns about the environmental impact as analysts continue to increase weighting on this metric in the future. But CargoJet has a multi-pronged approach to ESG, which includes the adoption of sustainable aviation fuels, fleet modernization, and by continuing to remain in step with their peers. And so with that, we'd like to reiterate our buy recommendation. We'd like to thank you very much for your time, and we'll open up the floor to any questions you may have.
um, you mentioned that your growth is actually leveraged to some key customers, and that translates to operating leverage. Uh, within being higher, uh, re- within having their revenue highly concentrated, actually translate to lower pricing power, and hence lower operating leverage going forward. So first addressing why they have so much operating leverage in their business, about 80% of their costs are fixed. And these only increase when they increase the amount of hubs that they have or when they increase your fleet. And so right now, CargoJet is not planning to increase their fleet for the next few years. And so their cost structure will remain 80% fixed. And in terms of their pricing of their contracts, they are CPI based. And so that's inflation based. And they also have some contracts that are CPI plus 1% as well. And so they do, do still have pricing power in that segment. And then the remaining 25% of their business that isn't under contract, they have significant pricing power with their customers. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I want to ask over the next few years, it seems like they do have a, a good moat, a um, few comp- direct competitors. Um, are they just going to, did you get the sense they're just going to ride the current success or positioning that they have? Or do they have any other ideas or strategic plans for growth beyond maintaining the market position they have? Yeah, so I can speak to uh, the first half of your question, and I'll let my colleague Aryaman speak to the growth on the international piece. Um, but domestically, CargoJet, we view, has a very strong competitive, competitive positioning, and we're very bullish on the growth of e-commerce in Canada. So Canada, as compared to other developed countries, has low e-commerce penetration. Um, and so as a result, you know, and this is part of something that, that we saw Amazon speak about as well, um, we expect a lot of growth in e-commerce in Canada. Uh, and so we think on the domestic side, they'll continue to grow very well um, as a result of e-commerce. And then speaking on the international growth aspects, their customers such as DHL and uh, DHL are heavily investing into high growth regions within Latin America and Southeast Asia. And we expect these to grow significantly higher at 20 plus growth rates over the next couple of years. And we think those are significant catalysts that help, that help, that help drive future growth for the business. If you could uh, say a word more about uh, the competition or potential competition on Canadian market, because uh, it's of course right that there is a restriction on the on the cabotage inside uh, Canada, but uh, I guess uh, there are some other options, especially for companies like DHL or Amazon, which also or UPS, uh, which also operate their own planes and carry their own freight. Yeah. So to speak, if we could go to barriers to entry. So you're right. Uh, regulation and these cabotage laws are very, very a, bi- a big part of what keeps uh, uh, um, cargo jet insulated from an international perspective. Cabotage laws are employed by 91 UN member states and they're quite common in, in practice and they stop international players from flying you know, uh, point to point within Canada. Uh, but there's other major barriers to entry as well. So ca- cargo jet um, provides a very essential service to these players uh, acting as, as a bit of a volume buffer. And so um, cargo jet is able to, to provide a unique value proposition that these players wouldn't necessarily be able to provide for themselves. I think I'll add, so we talked to a consultant that has over 20 years of experience in the industry, and first point is he believed that there was no reason that these relationships would ever deteriorate simply because as a player like DHL or Amazon, you only have visibility into your volumes a week or two in advance, and it doesn't make sense to invest heavily in buying your own fleet if it's not going to be fully utilized, and so CargoJet plays an essential part in providing you know flexibility for them to scale and flex up and down. Doesn't DHL have a larger fleet than CargoJet? Yep. So again, this is part of, of why DHL uses uses CargoJet to provide flexibility with that. Um, and it also helps them more agilely push into different markets as they're in full control of you know, where the operations go. And you know, CargoJet, 99% on-time performance rate is an excellent operator that provides you know, the credibility uh, as well as the flexibility and reliability. On slide 36 on ESG, your scores for ESG, you have your own scores for ESG versus LSEC. And where do you think the difference lies between your rating and their rating? So with our ESG rating, we took a look at the SASB material- materiality map and we used that to inform us on which kind of criteria we would like to choose for our rating. And so because of the sub-industry that is air cargo, we we weighted it on a sub-industry level um, and took more of an emphasis on that air cargo industry rather than the freight and transportation and logistics industry as a whole. Uh, you, you had mentioned that the company picked up on their share buybacks and dividends. I'm, I'm wondering how, how did you how did you see either uh, like reflected in, in the stock and then um, do, do you have a sense of how they're allocating between dividends and uh, buybacks? Yeah, absolutely. So they've 
had a share buyback for about 1.5 million of their shares, which is about 9% of their public flow. And they've completed half of that so far. And they've indicated they want to continue with that. And in terms of their capital allocation priorities, they're pretty evenly spaced between dividend growth, share buybacks, and the fact that they're trying to deleverage further from where they are at two and a half times their upper limit. They're now at 2.2 times. So they're pretty much saying they're evenly going between dividend growth, deleveraging, and share buybacks. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, your ESG matrix and uh, and your approach to to that, would you expect um, a major risk uh, regarding ESG or ESG regulation in uh, years to come for the company and for the company business model? Uh, hint: I don't need. I don't. Uh, I'm not asking about marketing. I'm asking about financials. Yeah. So. I think our perspective on that, if we go to Cargo Jet's multi-prong ESG approach, is that they're doing all the right things to decarbonize their model and take strides towards being a cleaner company. So they're investing heavily in sustainable aviation fuels as well as fleet modernization. So they've recently bought a number of planes that carry, you know, 30% more uh, volume, but use 60% less fuel. And so they're effectively taking strides in the right direction. And with respect to financials, as this is an essential service, the customers don't do because they want to, they do because they have to. We don't believe that that will be reflected heavily in the you know financials and the revenue performance going forward. I don't I don't mean that. Uh, I I was rather thinking of uh, what would you expect the company would be forced to do and how it would be reflected in the results regarding the the regulation regarding ESG because from what I can see is on one hand. Canada has got a very strong uh, trend towards uh, ESG, clean uh, psychology, and so on and so on. On the other hand, if, if I understand the business model correctly of that company, that company basically provides cargo, which is absolutely necessary to certain uh, places and certain inhabitants. And I, I'm not sure, you tell me, but uh, I guess if uh, cargo just stops flying to equal quit, uh, the city will have a big problem in uh, supply of anything. So we do not see this as a major risk or concern to Cargo Jet's business model. As as you mentioned, the these services are crucial and important to residents such as residents within Ecola. If we could go to um, their domestic network map, we can see that they are very far north and it's very difficult for really any other mode of transportation to be able to reach them within a timely manner to deliver those goods. And so we do not see ESG as being a risk to them being able to provide their services. The government won't hurt them. Correct. In other words. I know you said most of the costs are fixed. Um, th did you happen to look in a price of oil or, or any other uh, variable? cost that could cut into margins? Yeah. So they have full fuel cost pass through in all of their contracts. And if we look at the correlation between energy prices or oil prices and, and their stock, you know, there's a weak negative correlation as a result of their, their full fuel cost pass through. So how, how do they make it to have a fixed fuel cost? Is it, uh, is it based on the, on the contract on the other side? So they are, their prices are related to, I guess, not oil, but jet, are they using jet A or jet B? Uh, Jet A, and, and it's based on fuel surcharges that the customers will pay on top of their rate. So it's fully passed through. Okay, got it. So from your perspective, is or from investors' perspective, is a fixed cost. It's it's really not fixed, but but from their perspective, it's fixed. Okay. That's a follow-up question just on the um, the contracts that they have with their, their customers. Is there like an average uh, duration or time that um, those, those things exist? I uh, ask in part because, you know, between the stock price and you know the pandemic for example you saw pretty much a clear it was responding to what was happening in the market versus maybe insulated by like longer contracts so my question is um do you have a sense of what their the duration of the contracts with the customers are like yeah so these are their their four of their major customers and as you can see a lot of them are extended through 2029 and 2030 uh, and these have high minimum volume and revenue guarantees which is a big part of why they only, you know, their top line performance only declined 2% during the, you know, one of the most severe freight recessions we've had in recent memory, whereas a lot of their peers uh, and other trucking and logistics businesses either went bankrupt or had to fire major parts of their workforce. 
Okay, uh, it seems the company is operating quite well on a very high margin and a very favorable economic condition. Uh, but it doesn't look like, and also you are not, you are not presenting it, so it's probably not doing it, uh, thinking of uh, expansion and thinking of uh, going, to, going to other markets and uh, trying, to, trying to use the leverage, trying to use their, their expertise. Uh, would you expect the company to just stay in Canada and grow uh, with, the, with the GDP growth of Canada? Because that's also an issue, right? The, the Canadian economy is growing with, with its, its rate and probably CargoJet may find it uh, difficult to, to outperform it. Yeah, so I think two things to address here. So first, um, as for the, the domestic business, we think you know, the CargoJet will, will outperform the Canadian economy because of the e-commerce penetration. And so as more Canadian customers increase their e-commerce usage, we'll see CargoJet being able to benefit directly from that because they're directly playing into e-commerce. And then as for growth opportunities on the international side, CargoJet is, you know, through their ACMI partnerships, which are all largely international, they're expanding into Southeast Asia and Latin America. And we view these as much faster growing markets. And so because of their e-commerce marketplace partnerships, because of the partnerships with players like DHL, they're able to continue to grow in these high growth markets and able to actually capitalize on the organic growth that's coming from those markets as well. Given um, that some of the passenger airlines are playing in, a, in the, the space a bit, um, has uh, this company ever considered playing in the, pa what, have you gotten a sense that they've considered expanding into the passenger market at all? No, we don't, we don't think that would be attractive for them to do. Um, the company seems like a monopoly in its market with 90% market share. What kind of premium would you attribute to you? to the company versus its peers globally, yeah. Do you see any pressure from uh, either central or local government side uh, to decrease prices or decrease margin of the, of the company? Because in such conditions, it's quite often that the government might help you, but, but they also put a pressure on, uh, on you through due to obvious reasons. So just to address your question first, so so we haven't placed a premium on the business through any parts of our valuation. I'm taking a very conservative valuation um, throughout. And then on the regulatory side, since it's not a B2C business, there's no significant risk that the business, you know, takes advantage of consumers. And so the government views this more favorably, and we don't believe there's any, you know, incentive for them to step in and, and break up the monopoly. Oh, as maybe a nat natural next question. Um, as a almost monopoly um are they still in cinema or are they still encouraged to to end do you think they have the right um governance in place to continue uh innovating and being you know market leader absolutely so we, if we could take a look on our view on management we can see that cargo jet has a very strong management team as they have a strong track record um they've been able to build this business with within an industry that's previously failed to have any successful businesses. And they have a reputation of operational excellence with that 99% on-time performance. And so we believe that CargoJet's management team is well-equipped to continue to help CargoJet drive growth within um, this market, despite being a monopolistic player.